Hey everyone, welcome to the next part of the Earth Science Final Review Master Overview. This is going to be used to study for your final. Like I said in the other part one and part two videos, this is very vague. You can check out the link in the description to go uh, see the full specific playlist if you need help specifically on certain topics. So if you see something that you're confused on as I walk you through this, um, go check out the other playlist and specifically go to that video so you can learn about that. All right, so today it looks like it's going to be energy and weather in this video, so we'll see how long it goes. Here is the view of the playlist that I was talking about, and if you can, please hit the subscribe button because this is going to be probably five parts, so you'll be notified when the next parts come out. All right, so here we go. Energy time. So this chart you have to be able to convert between Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. The most problematic thing that people run into on this is that the Fahrenheit goes up by 2, Celsius goes up by 1, and Kelvin goes up by 1. So just be careful on those. Electromagnetic energy. So you have to know that essentially heat goes from source to sink. So that's the heat source and it travels to an area that is cooler. So hot to cold. An energy that comes from the sun comes in all types of wavelengths. Specifically, the ones we're going to talk about in this unit is going to be UV radiation, which is the one that gives you sunburn, and infrared radiation, uh, which is heat. Objects that are good absorbers are also good radiators. So dark colored and rough texture is going to be your best absorber and a good radiator of heat. All right, here's the big thing to know for the energy unit. Energy from the sun is in the form of visible light, which is short wave radiation. That energy comes in, it hits the ground, and then it's re-radiated out of the earth as long wave infrared heat. So it takes in the UV and spits out the infrared. Specific heat. How fast something heats up and cools down? It's the amount of energy required to heat one gram of the substance one degree Celsius. So the higher the number, the longer it takes to heat it up and cool it down. And you need to know how to use this chart here. This is on page one. Here's an example question. If you had 10 grams of ice and you wanted to increase the temperature by 10 degrees, how many joules would you need? So you go to find your ice specific heat. So you do 2.11 times 10 grams because that's the amount. And that's only by one degree. So you need to multiply it by 10 degrees. So if you do that, you just move the decimal place too. So it'd be 211 joules. So you just multiply everything. Coastal cities have a smaller temperature range because they are near water, and water has a high specific heat. So if you have an area near the water, their highs don't go that high and their lows don't go too low. But if you're a continental city that's like inland, so not near the water, they get very high highs for the day and very low lows for the day. So again, know how to use the properties of water chart heat energy gained or released during all the phase changes of water are on page one. You have to know the difference between conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is through contact, convection is through density differences in liquid or gas, and radiation is radiation through empty space of heat. All right, so at this point, that would be where you would have taken a midterm, most likely. So we're gonna go on to the next unit, which is weather. So the first thing in weather you have to know is the water cycle. You should be familiar with every term in this picture. The one that people forget is transpiration. That comes from plants, but I'm not going to sit here and explain the whole water cycle. Just know it. Warmer air can hold more water than cold air because there's more space in warm air. The molecules are more spread out. That is going to be humidity. So relative humidity is the percentage of how much the air is full of water. And the first relationship you have to know is as temperature of the air mass increases, the relative humidity goes down because you have the same amount of water vapor, but it's a warmer temperature, so there's just more space. So you could see here in the 30 degrees Celsius picture, there is more space, but the same amount of water. So as you go from 10 to 20 to 30, relative humidity goes down. As you get closer to 100% relative humidity, at 100%, that's when condensation occurs. So that's when your clouds start to form and then you can get rain afterwards or whatever, snow or sleet. Uh, dew point. This is the temperature the air has to cool down to in order for the water vapor to condense. And a couple of things happen when you hit the dew point. Let's go over them. So number one is 
condensation. Number two, relative humidity is 100%. The next thing is the air is saturated. So that, those are like the three, I think. Oh, and then you could say clouds form. That would be good too. So you have to know when the temperature hits the dew point, all those things are true. So here it is. And we're going on. Sling psychrometer is the instrument used to measure air temperature um, and dew point and relative humidity. It could do all three. But mainly you're going to see this as relative humidity and dew point. This is the one, that's the one with the wet bulb and dry bulb, and you got to use the chart. So definitely be familiar on how to get the dew point and relative humidity on the reference table. All right, clouds. So we got our acronym, REC DC. Remember it, rise, expand, cools to the dew point, condenses, and they condense onto condensation nuclei. Without the condensation nuclei, you can't make the droplets land on anything, so you wouldn't get a cloud to form. Higher altitude is lower pressure. As temperature goes up, air pressure drops because you're going up in the air. There's less air molecules. We use a barometer to measure air pressure, and there's two units, inches of mercury and millibars, and you have to know how to convert between them using the chart on the reference table, page 13. Also, the sea level pressure, 1,013.2 millibars, that is here listed as one atmosphere. If you forget it, it tells you. Okay, you got to remember these too. High pressure means cooler temperatures, lower humidity, and better weather. Also, high pressure spins outwards and clockwise. You can remember that with Hawk. Then we got low pressure. That's going to be warm, high humidity, and poor weather. And you got Lick, low inwards, counterclockwise, turning. Station models. I'm not going to sit here and th draw a station model and show you how to do it, but you have to know how to do it. Um, you, the most important thing is probably knowing how to convert your air pressure. Remember, it's if it's between 0 and 4, you put a 10 in front, and then 5 through 9, you put a 9 in front. So if it's 196, that's a 0 and a 4, so you put a 10 in front. So I like to write it all out, and then you just put a decimal between the last two. And if you want to go from here back, you just take the last three numbers. So it would be 196. All right, it tells you how to do the whole station model on the reference table. All right, then we got wind. Wind always goes from high to low pressure. They're named from where they came from. The cause of wind is that Earth is unequally heated, so you're getting different temperatures, and then you're going to get different pressures, which then causes the wind to move. We are in the prevailing southwesterlies wind belt in the United States, so all weather goes from west to east in our wind belt. They also steer away hurricanes, which is great. You have to know how to use page 14 on the reference table. It's this chart. They really don't ask that many things about this chart, but here's your southwesterly winds between 30 and 60. If you forget that we live in there, you can know by this chart. So New York is in there. Here is our air masses, so you have to know what all the air masses mean, MT, CP, CT, maritime means it's over the water, cold is polar, tropicals, warm, and continentals over land. So CP, the major thing to know is that it comes from Canada over the United States, so remember Canada for CP, MT, Gulf of Mexico. Those are your two land masses that you have to, um, land masses or really Gulf of Mexico's water. Um, those are the two locations that you got to know for those two air masses. It tells you them on page 13 if you forget, but it won't tell you that CP is from Canada and MT is from the Gulf of Mexico. It won't say it, so you got to remember that part. Land and sea breeze. Know how they work and what they look like. So if this didn't say sea breeze, I can figure it out because the arrow is going this way, so it's coming from the sea, and then air goes from high to low. So that's a sea breeze. Land breeze is the opposite. High to low. So it comes from the land. An anemometer, that's going to measure our wind speed. So it's miles per hour or knots. Isobars, when they're close together, that means there's a lot of wind there and it's probably low pressure. We got to know our fronts. Cold front looks more steep. Warm front is more gradual. 
For a low pressure cyclone, we have to know this shape here. Remember, the precipitation is on the cold front right here, ahead of the warm front over here, and then around the low. You got to know your weather systems that are associated with them too. Cold front's going to bring he heavy rain, blizzards, violent storms, and warm front's going to be widespread steady rain. Here's another low pressure cyclone, mid latitude cyclone. There's your fronts, they are on the reference table. All weather goes west to east, so you might be asked questions about that. El Nino, La Nina, I would just be somewhat familiar with them, know that they change climate, and it has to do with the winds either speeding up or slowing down between the United States and Asia. Lake effects, no, a little mini topic. The cold air moves over warm lake water, the warm water heats up the bottom layer of the air, gets more moisture to be evaporated, and then you get big snowfall on the other side. So if the lake wasn't there, it wouldn't have gotten all that extra moisture to drop. You should know that on top of mountains, it's cold. You got the orographic effect to know. Windward and leeward. Windward side of the mountain is cool and wet. That's where all your vegetation is. The leeward is dry, arid, hot. Arid means dry. So you get deserts on that side. Monsoons, currently common in India. So that's probably what they're going to ask about. Just know how they work. It's a giant sea breeze or a giant land breeze, essentially. Then we got our storms, hurricanes. Things to know about hurricanes. Storm surge is the, the worst part about it. It's a big amount of flooding. Hurricanes end when you get rid of the water or it goes over cold water. It's got to be nice and warm, the water, so that's why it happens down south. Or it can move over land and start to die. What should you do? Board up your windows, stock up on food, evacuate to higher ground, prepare a first aid kit. So you have a couple of days normally to prepare for the hurricane. Unlike tornadoes, which are unpredictable. This is when you're going to get CP and MT meeting up. They form a funnel cloud. What should you do? Go right into a basement or a storm cellar. Cover yourself. Maybe grab a first aid kit real quick. But the basement's the number one answer for that. Otherwise, thunderstorm, blizzard, just stay inside. And that's going to be that. So that, that was two more units right there. So I'm going to pause this video here. And then the next video is going to be probably rocks and minerals and Wedgel. I could probably get both of those in one video. All right, so that was just a quick overview. Good luck and stay tuned for the next part. Later.